Surgical procedure to remove the large white mass oh. from my my uh, lower jaw. Uh, any questions about the the lab or the quiz or any of the scheduling stuff? Uh, are they gonna start it? All right. So yeah. It's in the quiz if something is in the bottom level of the priority queue, does it ever go back up to the top unless it finishes an IO operation? Uh, you know, we talked about uh, this and the kind of rules for an actual MFQ would have this boosting strategy of every so often everything gets put back. Um, but for the quiz, it's a simpler model. It once it's in level four, it's just gonna stay there. Unless as you say it comes back from IO. Other questions? All right, so the very first lab that uh, we did was about implementing a number of system calls that did stuff for the, that, that supported the user doing file operations. Open files, and read and write them, and so on. But all of those system calls just kind of uh, got the user input, validated it, and then handed it off to uh, an actual file system function. Uh, there was some kind of process management in there with the open file tables. Uh, but what we're going to talk about this week and Monday is how does the file system part of the kernel actually works. Uh, almost any uh, kind of, any sort of general purpose computing kernel is going to need some way to interact with uh, with files. So uh, let's take a step back to start with and think uh, how would a computer system actually boot up? How would it start. We, we begin, uh, there's, the system has no power, um, and we have various components, and then we, we give it power and say start. Uh, I would like to, to kind of get us thinking in these terms. I'd like you to uh, take three or four minutes and brainstorm with your, your neighbors, kind of uh, what are some steps or some components of the system or some things that would need to happen uh, to get us from uh, we are now providing electricity to okay now we're actually running the kernel um, and you can think of this as uh, you looked at part of this um, in the lab zero the sort of warm-up with GDB looking at different steps but now we're kind of looking from the very start um, so take a few minutes and, and brainstorm about that all right, let's, uh, let's discuss what's, what's some component of our, give me a, uh, a component of the system that uh, will need to be involved in this process. Huh? Like, can you give the CPU some instructions? There's probably some like default, like, first instruction for CPU to do is this. Yeah, we're absolutely going to need uh, we're going to need some programs or some instructions that we actually start off uh, start off running. Absolutely. Uh, what's another another piece of this puzzle? We'll need to know how much physical memory we have available. And like set up the different parts of that for the kernel to use, like the system reserve memory. Yeah, exactly. We need to know how much memory do we have, how is it going to be laid out, um, and where does the CPU get instructions from? 
just in general. Yeah, it has to fetch them from memory. Uh, so if we have instructions to start at, uh, we're going to need to get those into memory. Victor. Oh, oh, you mean like load them into memory? Because that's what I was going to ask. Uh, well, so my next question was, could they just be in memory oh, at the okay. very start? No. No. Why not? Because there is with no power to memory, memory doesn't exist. Yes, so our physical memory can't be holding any data before we give it power. So if we're starting at the moment that we turn the power on for the system, uh, our instructions can't be in memory at that point. So we need to get them into memory. Uh, where, uh, is there somewhere we could put the instructions where we could find them uh, at this at this it's like some specific bottom of this, like always like 10 to addresses 10 to 150 or whatever. Yeah, so we have our uh, cylinder of, of power, our disk, and we have, uh, and I, I like to always point that this is going to be at a fixed position, that there is some, um, uh, there are some instructions. A program, often called the bootloader, uh, which is which is a kind of fixed sized uh, chunk of uh, bytes on the disk at a fixed position, uh, and these are kind of the first instructions we're going to feed. Um, or, or some some of the first instructions that we're going to uh, to feed in. So uh, if so, having this this bootloader on our disk, um, there's. Like, could there be, like, if this is, or we're going to boot up our system, um, and the CPU just uh, immediately uh, starts reading, uh, uh, kind of loads our, our bootloader program into memory and starts reading the instructions, uh, Anyone see potential downsides or like is it fine to just like have this initial stuff on the disk and that's exactly where we start? Is that um, Isn't it usually the OS that's uh, accessing the disk and so if there's no OS, the CPU can't? Yeah, our, our disk probably has some like disk driver um, program, but that is usually part of the kernel. Uh, and so we haven't actually put the kernel into memory yet. Uh, um, so uh, we might need um, some, like in order to, to know how to read stuff, interface with this disk, we probably need some program that's separate somewhere. Um, that even before this bootloader gets us started, um, a program that can kind of get us uh, at least to the step of loading the bootloader into memory and maybe uh, some other hardware initialization um, as well. Uh, so we have. Uh, anyone uh, have an idea of, or have heard of something that you think might play this role? Sebastian? This BIOS? Yeah, so there is going to be a part of our system called the, 
basic input output system, usually pronounced BIOS. And this BIOS is typically stored in a kind of special separate piece of hardware memory that is read only. So um, why would we want R and R, R, I guess, to put a little more in this picture? If we have physical, physical memory here, and uh, there's some kind of part of physical memory that's not necessarily part of, uh, that's not part of the, the general main memory, but some part of memory that has bio, the BIOS in it. Um, and you might think that there's a little bit of non-volatile storage and persistent storage that's part of the hardware that holds the BIOS, and that when the system gets booted up, there's just logic in the hardware that takes that BIOS program and puts it into uh, a special piece of memory. Silas? How does BIOS get edited? How does that get, and, does it, and when does it happen, and who does it? And... Uh, so there's read-only hardware memory. So the BIOS is typically, uh, uh, if we're talking about the actual, like a desktop computer, there's a component called the motherboard, which kind of the CPU and the memory and all the other pieces sort of plug into. Uh, and the motherboard has this hardware-only memory that has the BIOS on it. And it's just loaded on there when this thing is manufactured, uh, and then is typically not changed. Um, there is uh, something you can do, which is called flashing the BIOS, where you uh, overwrite it uh, with new BIOS. Uh, this can you know, render, the com render the computer completely unable to start up if there's some problem that occurs in the middle of that. Uh, I had a recent experience with this, uh, Windows 11. Uh, to upgrade to Windows 11, you, there are certain kind of hardware security features uh, that Windows 11 requires. Um, so I was like, you know, I, there's this desktop computer. Let me play around and see if I can turn these on, uh, uh, see if they're supported. And going in, the BIOS on modern computers often kind of a, uh, has a graphical user interface that you can get into kind of before the operating system boots up. So you can kind of play with settings in there. There's often like processor speed and all sorts of, kind of um, different settings in there, controlling how the cooling system works or whatever it is. Uh, but it's possible to change these settings in such a way that the operating system can't boot up and you can't get back into the BIOS to undo the change. Uh, I quickly found myself in this situation. Um, I was like, well, did I just permanently brick my mother's computer? This might not be a great situation. Um, fortunately, uh, on at least many motherboards, there are two like little metal pins that if you complete the circuit between these pins by just like touching a pen to them, uh, it will like reset the BIOS to like the factory settings to get you out of exactly this pickle where I've just turned this computer into into a brick. Um, so yes, you can change the BIOS. You usually don't want to unless you definitely know what you're doing. Um, is there a reason why? We wouldn't want to kind of put our entire operating system in this like special chunk of memory. Uh, it's really small. It's probably. Yeah, I mean, we could we could make it bigger. That wouldn't be that big a deal. Will? Just as a tangential question, did that mean that if you trip those pins on a computer from before the meltdown inspector, you would undo the security patch? Uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Uh, although it seems like. I mean, we'll talk about this security vulnerability called Meltdown um, next week. Uh, uh, that was something that had to be fixed in, in the hardware settings. So yeah, I think that that uh, resetting to kind of pre, um, pre patch things, although uh, I don't know the enough details about how that patch um, 
like I think we'll 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 get into this when we when we talk about meltdown. But uh, it's possible the patch was at a level of software that um, meant that even if the BIOS is reset, uh, the 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 kernel could be like telling the telling the hardware settings um, to avoid this vulnerability. Um, like, you don't want the whole operating system because then you can't change it. Like, you kind of want the operating system to be able to be changeable much easier than with the BIOS because the BIOS is like the lowest level that has to be good. Let's make this super like sealed off. And... Exactly. We, we typically want to be able to easily install updates to our operating system. Uh, read only memory is really not conducive to that. Uh, so, having the operating system say on the disk um, is, a, is a, a nicer place to, to put it. So, our kind of step one. Our BIOS runs, our BIOS takes the bootloader, kind of reads the bootloader from the disk, uh, copies it uh, into our, our memory. Um, the bootloader's job is to get the kernel off of the disk and load that into memory. So we have this kind of uh, Series of, of kind of bootstrapping or, or startup where our like special hardware BIOS program uh, reads a part of our operating system um, uh, called the bootloader, which is a small piece of, of software that uh, re loads the kernel to memory and does maybe other setup the kernel depends on, and then then we start the kernel off and running. And we're thinking about a desktop computer. The kernel is going to take what kind of whatever program runs the like login screen and takes a password and so on, uh, gets that uh, into memory so that that can be running when when the computer is finished booting up. Um, does that make sense? Questions on on this procedure? So BIOS is shared across all operating systems, right? Okay, so like, um, so it, 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 it is bootloader shared across all operating systems? Uh, the bootloader is part of the operating system. Oh, okay. okay. How frequently is BIOS changed from like, better, like, yeah. Um, so the, like, or well. Or for some for some company, how frequently will they be changing the BIOS on their computers? Um, I'd have to, to look up a like version history to give you an exact like uh, update schedule, but um, hardware is regularly updated, and so I assume BIOS would be regularly updated uh, along with it. Uh, actually, uh, BIOS is a kind of older and simpler style of of uh, a program that, that does this. I don't remember what it stands for, but I think there is UEFI or UEIF. There's some kind of newer version uh, uh, that kind of performs the same uh, role as the BIOS, but it has many more features. Um, this is one of those, those things that Windows 11 says you have to have because there's kind of security checks that this, uh, uh, this style of, um, kind of Bootstrapping program can do that. That the simple old-fashioned BIOS does not do. If they update BIOS to deal with like new hardware on a computer, like that when they make a when they like design a computer, they have to design a BIOS for that computer to deal with like that specific hardware configuration. People, are there ever issues where like the BIOS has like bugs in it, and like the computer, like certain like models of computer just have defective BIOS? Um. So there could certainly be bugs in the BIOS uh, that would render a computer inoperable. Um, I would imagine that you're not designing a new BIOS for every possible configuration, uh, that you design a BIOS that can handle kind of the full range of CPUs that are currently in use. Um, and then a particular company that manufactures a particular motherboard has a specific BIOS that they put on it, they can kind of 
include of everything related to that particular um, uh, component. Uh, something that's more common is that your OS kernel has device drivers. So uh, this is like how you how you talk to the disk, um, and it's common that your OS kernel does not have a driver for some particular device that you're trying to use. This happens a lot with Linux. Uh, Linux open sourced. Uh, the, so there's not a lot of incentive for people to kind of volunteer their time implementing a Linux driver for some commercial device. Um, While well, Windows and Mac, they want people to buy their things, so they try and kind of have device drivers for everything. But uh, uh, Linux, like graphics cards, certain mice and keyboards, like there's all sound cards, all sorts of stuff where Linux might just not have uh, a working driver for that for that component. Other questions? All right. So this is uh, one reason why I had bring up this picture is to highlight the, the role that our disk is playing in getting our system started up uh, and to also uh, introduce the term block device which uh, is our block device is a uh, device that reads and writes in fixed size blocks or, or chunks. So some of you may have seen that there's uh, something called BDEV in OSV, stands for block device. That's code to interface with some device that has like uh, 128 bytes or 256 bytes or 4096 bytes, whatever the block size is, it just only deals with uh, reading and writing in, in these large chunks. Uh, and then we think of a reason why uh, we want our disk to be a block device while we wouldn't want our physical memory to be a block device. Like if we're storing data smaller than the chunks in memory, like we want to use all of our memory, so we waste a bunch of space. But our disk is a lot bigger, so we don't care if there's a bit of wasted space. Yeah, and there's also potentially a performance benefit as well. Uh, our disk is pretty slow, and so we'd much rather have the operations like read a big chunk into memory and then kind of give whatever part of that chunk the user actually asked for to them rather than, uh, and then have it sitting around in memory, the user like reads a bunch of, kind of does a bunch of like four byte reads from our disk, uh, it would be both kind of uh, a hard, uh, uh, many um, uh, technologies that we, we would use for this would actually kind of wear them out faster to just do a kind of a bunch of small reads rather than kind of doing it in these, in these large chunks. All right. So this is kind of our, our, our hardware picture <coughs> hardware picture on uh, Friday. Uh, we're going to talk about how uh, a file system actually arranges and finds uh, data on the disk. That's our kind of file system implementation. Uh, Monday, we'll talk about file system reliability. So what are, what are some techniques for uh, preventing the disk from getting corrupted and then just not like the, we lose, like the computer crashes in the middle of a, a disk write. Uh, is our disk just um, uh, useless, or is there some way we can, we can recover from this? Um, what I would like to uh, focus on today is just kind of our file system uh, <coughs> API in action. So uh, just kind of going into more detail about what are the operations that uh, we want a file system to be able to do. We kind of covered this very briefly to prepare for lab one, um, kind of what was open and, and read and write. 
Uh, but today is going to be covering that in more detail. Um, but before that, uh, we've got uh, one Woodrow Wilson to talk about. Uh, you may remember that uh, Wilson was uh, elected with 42% uh, of the vote um, because Theodore Roosevelt and uh, Taft uh, were splitting the, the Republican vote. So he's actually he's the, uh, the first uh, Southerner to be elected president since 1848. Elected in, in 1912, um, and the the only uh, citizen of the Confederacy to ever um, be elected uh, president, since he was kind of living in, in Virginia at the time of the, the Civil War. Uh, he was, uh, I think, uh, a, a kid then, um, but uh, he had a kind of a, a pro Southern. Uh, outlook on the Civil War. He was kind of a noted historian and academic before he got into politics and wrote uh, popular histories of the U.S. Uh, that portrayed the Southern cause uh, in the Civil War in a positive light. Um, he was, uh, and so he was, uh, I guess, uh, uh, well documented that he was very racist. He instituted a bunch of segregation. Uh, in the U.S. government. Um, uh, at the same time, he was very progressive on other issues, uh, uh, labor rights and uh, fighting corporate power and kind of expanding the role of the government and, and helping people. Uh, he was also uh, an internationalist. He had a kind of, uh, particularly uh, after uh, the U.S. got involved in World War One. Uh, had the outlook that uh, the U.S. could kind of make the the world safe for democracy um, was was a, a slogan of his, and so he played a, a major role in the uh, peace conference at the end of the war. Here's the the Big Four: uh, Wilson, uh, the French uh, leader George Clemenceau, uh, the Italian leader Prime Minister Orlando, and the uh, United Kingdom Prime Minister. Lloyd George, and so kind of these four kind of car like remade the map of Europe, like kind of made all these decisions about uh, what the borders between countries would be. Uh, they set up the, the League of Nations, though uh, Wilson could not get that ratified in the U.S. The U.S. didn't actually join uh, the League of Nations, um, and uh, one a political cartoon from this time when there were. Uh, when there was racial violence in uh, East St. Louis, where 40 to 150 African Americans were, were killed. Here's uh, Wilson holding a, uh, the world uh, must be safe for democracy, and the, the caption to this uh, cartoon was like something like, Mr. Wilson, why can't we make democracy safe at home first? Um, while Wilson was out kind of trying to rally support for the League of Nations in the country, he suffered a massive stroke. Uh, he was completely paralyzed on his left side, um, and was basic. Like his decision uh, making was was bad and impulsive. He uh, couldn't maintain concentration, uh, and this was largely covered up. Like they they didn't tell anyone that the state. I mean, people knew he had a stroke, but they didn't tell anyone how, how bad things were when he would meet with leaders of Congress. It was for. Uh, only about five minutes max, and then would be ushered out because he was sort of like that was about how long he could focus. And he had, uh, in while he was in office, his first wife had died, uh, and he fell in love and, and remarried uh, Edith Wilson here uh, while he was president. Um, and this is a kind of one of the first uh, posed photos of Wilson post stroke. His left side is totally paralyzed, so his wife is holding the paper. Steady as he as he signs it, um, and Edith Wilson is sometimes referred to as the first female president because she assumed a lot of, like she she assumed uh, without any official recognition a lot of the duties of the president because Wilson was so uh, incapacitated in his last um, his last year in office. Um, all right, that's our that's our presidential facts. 
So uh, what I want to do now is go to Mantis. All right. And um, take a look at, at the file system API uh, in more detail. Uh, so you may uh, you may remember that um, when we had uh, the open system call, it would take in these flags and uh, the mode. Uh, and when you implemented this call, you just sort of handed these off to the file system. It didn't have to, to worry about them. So let's actually look at what these flags uh, and mode are. So our flags, there are many different of them. One, of, one important one is uh, ocreat, uh, which says uh, if the file doesn't exist, create it. Um, you may be wondering why is it create instead of create. Uh, someone asked one of the uh, creators of Unix, Ken Thompson, like what he would do differently if he could redesign Unix, and he replied, I spell Kriot with an E. <laughs> like there's not a good reason why this is lacking the last E. They just decided this and then apparently regretted it. Um, so we can uh, pass in um, uh, all sorts of so another one that goes along with Kriot is trunk, which says if the file already exists, uh, overwrite whatever is already there. Like basically erase what's already there and then kind of write into this new file will we'll, uh, uh, we'll overwrite it. Um, and there's actually a separate call Kriot, which passes in this standard kind of uh, trio of flags where Create a new file that doesn't exist. Make it so you can write to the file um, and overwrite a file that already exists there. And kind of each of these flags is some pattern of bits, and oring them together says like kind of set all these flags to true. Um, in addition to the flags, uh, there are these. Uh, Things we can pass in for the mode when we are creating a new file uh, that say who's going to have permission and what permissions will those be when those files are created. And I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about this, um, but uh, the thing to take away right now is that we have permission at Linux tracks permissions for a user, for a group that might have multiple users, and then for everyone else. So any file has, can uh, the user, uh, can, can the person who owns this file read, write, and execute it? Can the group that owns this file read, write, and execute it? And can anyone on the system read, write, and execute it? Questions on, on open or on these? All right, so let's look at what is actually involved when we uh, uh, read a file. So I'm going to, by echo hello, just prints out hello. And then on the shell, I will use output redirection. This bracket will say take standard out, which we know is just a file. And then instead, have it go to this other file. So this says, instead of sending standard out to the terminal, send standard out to a file called boot. And the cat command uh, will take whatever's in a file and put it to standard out. So I can say, show me what's in foo. It is hello, as we would expect. Now, I wonder, okay, this cat command, like what is what are steps that it needs to do to, to print out uh, hello in the terminal. Like foo is a file that's on disk and I need to get the the bytes from the disk to show up, show up in my terminal. 
Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Sorry, read from through and then copy the bytes of the standard out. Yes, so absolutely right. We want to read from foo, send those bytes to standard out. In order to read from foo, what are what is what are steps that might be involved in that? Uh, well, we're going to have to open foo, and we're also going to have to read those bytes as characters as opposed to something else. Yeah, we're going to need like some sequence of our file, uh, our system calls, like opening foo, reading bytes from that, and then writing those bytes uh, to to the terminal. You can actually see using this strace program. So show me every system call that happened when this program ran. So I'm going to say strace cat foo, um, and when I do this, I see there were actually a fair number of system calls that happened in this relatively small program. See, the first is our exec, which has our shell forked off uh, a new process to run our cat foo program, and then the exec system call replaces whatever code that program is running, which is the same as the parent that forked it, with the code from the program slash bin slash cat. So it turn, forks off a new process, turns it into cat, passes it command line arguments and uh, other stuff. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, opening files and mapping memory that uh, are just related to, in Linux, we're setting up a new process. There's all this stuff that happens with, with the memory of that process. Uh, but we can um, look uh, here. And we see that it opens at the current directory um, a file called foo, and it opens it as write only. Uh, uh, yeah, read only, sorry. Um, and then it reads, and we see that that open at returns three. Uh, anyone remember what this three would represent? Oh, the scripture. Exactly. It would be it would open and returns the file descriptor for the new file that was just opened, and then we can see that there's a read issued on that file descriptor. Um, uh, it reads two to the seventeenth bytes. That's kind of the, the apparently the default chunk that uh, uh, that it's reading in, um, and it shows us the contents of the buffer, which uh, uh, that. And we're, we're, it looks like we're seeing it kind of already have been, been filled in uh, with the contents of the file. Uh, and then we write to file descriptor one. What is that? Standard out. We write hello. Uh, we write six bytes. Uh, we see the hello that is actually being printed out mixed in uh, to, our, to our output. We could actually say direct standard out to the void, which is called dev null, just like you've been send infinite amounts of output there, and it will just disappear into the void. Um, and because this output is actually being sent to standard error, which is a different file descriptor, we can send standard out to somewhere else. Standard error still prints out, and we no longer see like standard out hello mixed in with this. Uh, so it writes hello. It reads again to see, like, is there anything left to read in the file? That returns zero, but then it knows that it's, it's finished, and it Closes everything up. Ellen? Why does it even need to do that if it knows it only got six bytes the last time? Because it knows, okay, six is less than the byte size, but there's like no way there's more. Uh, so if this were, uh, so I think that uh, basically read is allowed to do short counts, it's allowed to read less than, than you asked for. Um, and this is important, particularly for something like reading data over the network. Um, it may come in kind of gradually over time. So even if you're trying to read big chunks, it might be uh, small enough there. So my guess is the logic is we're just going to read until we get zero back, which we should only get if there's nothing left to read. Um, and that is something that is kind of good to do in general. In this particular case, I agree to optimize that, that one that one call, um, but that'd be of small of small value. So this is probably not super relevant, but I'm sort of curious. So when we start up a process, file descriptor 0 is standard in, 1 is standard out, and then when we open up 
foo, it's three. So is two standard error then? Yes, two is the standard error. It's a, a, another file descriptor for, uh, that, that's sent out to the terminal, uh, specifically so that we can separate sort of debugging or logging or this like S trace output from the like normal standard out, output. Um, and there are kind of shell commands to redirect standard. You can redirect standard error and standard out separately uh, as well. Other questions? All right. So one um, one interesting thing that I would like to uh, to mention is uh, renaming files. So there's a, a Linux uh, command MB, uh, short for move. So we can say, uh, I'll run ls, which is we just have a file foo in this directory. If I say move the file foo to bar, I have kind of changed the name of foo to bar. Um, and if I s trace, renaming bar back to foo, Uh, we see that there is a rename system call that just takes kind of the two, the old name and the new name. Um, and one uh, one thing about rename, let's see if we can see it in the. Uh, no, I don't think this is. There we go. Um, Uh, yes, yeah, so there's uh, rename is typically implemented such that this renaming step is atomic, um, uh, which uh, we like. Why why would it be really useful to have rename be an atomic operation? Daryl, tries a process trying to make, tries to make edits uh, to the previously titled. Yeah, we we really don't want uh, our system to be in some sort of in between state, like in in the in between, like starting the rename and ending the rename would be a like unfortunate time for stuff to happen. Uh, so make it if it's implemented in, a, in an atomic way, we avoid that issue. Um, so uh, there, this opens up an, an interesting question. If we find an eraser, let's say we're editing some file, foo.txt, in a text editor. And in order to have good performance, we don't want to constantly be reading and writing this file from disk. Uh, so we're going to have a copy of current We're going to have a copy of the current version of foo.txt in memory. Um, and then we want to we want to save our version to disk in such a way that um, that our, our kind of Update is guaranteed to have the kind of correct set of changes. We we we're editing this file. We put some like new lines in the middle of it, uh, and now we want to to save that to our disk and have this update. Um, I've guaranteed that the new file has this um, 
has the original contents plus the new ones that we, we've edited. So uh, I'd like you to uh, discuss with your, your neighbors how would you, how would you use uh, the, the calls that we, we've talked to, that we've uh, talked about so far, um, uh, like from lab one or that we, we've talked about today to, to implement this sort of guaranteed uh, save. All right, sounds like we're ready to, to talk about how uh, how am I approach this. Anyone have a, a suggestion on a general way to think about it or, or a way that you thought you might get started? Uh, we do want to uh, open a file. Um, at our disposal, all that we have, um, like the, the reason that this is this is following from uh, from the discussion of rename is that that is kind of of our our file system API uh, renaming um, where the the thing we're renaming to already exists, that's going to be atomic. So we want to have this kind of guaranteed we see the updates. We want to take advantage of that kind of rename, renaming atomic. Oh. We make whatever like text that opens is foo.txt. They make like a foo copy of text that's stored elsewhere in the file system. And then you save it, you save your changes to foo to foo copy.txt. And then once that's done, you rename foo copy.txt as foo.txt, which will atomically do Yes, that's uh, that would be a nice a nice way to approach this. Um, grab, uh, actually, this um, so actually, so we might do something like. Open a temporary version of our file. So, like, create a new a new temporary version. Uh, so, we say uh, make this writable, uh, create it if it doesn't exist. Uh, if it does exist, uh, trunk it, um, and uh, have it be uh, the user can read it. And uh, the kind of the owner can read it, and the owner can write it, uh, and then we would kind of write to this file descriptor kind of the current contents of the file, like our new version. Um, so we could have some buffer that contains the new version of the file. We know how many bytes that is, um, and then uh, a call that I didn't talk about is when we tell this tell the file system to write. It may not actually write at that moment. That our call to uh, write returning does not guarantee that the contents are actually written to disk. The contents may be in a buffer somewhere that later, eventually, get written to disk. This is useful for uh, performance. Uh, because disk writes are slow, we might want to collect several of them together uh, and do them all, all at once. Uh, and having this sort of flexibility is, is helpful for that. Uh, but we do have a system called fsync, that if we call fsync with a file descriptor, um, there's no H on that, um, uh, that will say, okay, you, this, you were saying, I'm forcing any pending writes to this file to happen now. So uh, I write to the file, and then make sure that they have uh, gone to the disk. I close my temporary file, uh, and then as I suggested, I rename uh, the temporary file uh, to the actual file. Uh, and that step happens atomically, so I have my kind of new complete version on disk, uh, and then I atomically sort of replace the old version with the new 
that make sense? What are your, what are your questions on this? Thanks. Um, I guess this still feels like it might not be guaranteed to save those correct changes if like a process interrupts in between the writing to the temporary foo.txt and like overwrites it with another trunk or something. If the user started like another process that could since the user can still <laughs> access this temporary file. Um, yeah, so uh, this would certainly not be robust against some malicious program that's deliberately trying to interfere. Um, uh, however, in sort of a, a normal circumstance, like the, uh, it's very likely that each, say, instance of our text editor is saving, like it would probably like foo.txt.tmp probably not. Great for this, you append maybe like a timestamp or something that's likely to be unique for this particular time to that. Uh, so if multiple of these are happening at, at once, which would mean that the user has multiple text editors open, is making different changes in each, and then is saving at like exactly the same time. Um, so again, uh, not likely. Uh, but then like one of them would still win. You'd still get a version of the file that was like consistent with one of these two. Which is ideal. What we don't want is a file that is like some weird Frankenstein of, uh, of um, changes from, from kind of multiple processes. Other questions? Jim. Oh, so like I'm, I'm just thinking if you're writing to a, like a very big file, then you have to make a complete copy of that. So if it, I, I, I'm assuming Linux probably has some way to partition a large file. Yeah, I mean, this would this would be the, uh, kind of the text editor's responsibility. Like, if I want my editor to be fast for large files, um, I'm probably keeping track of like which parts of the file ha has changed, um, and doing something clever with like kind of keeping the large file, like only keeping the changed parts in memory, and have some system kind of writing out those changed pieces. So yeah, if you want it to be performance for very large files. You have to do a lot of extra uh, extra work to make that to make that happen, um, but you can still use the same general strategy uh, in terms of you keep some temporary stuff and then atomically you kind of switch it over. Other questions? All right. So a few other kind of file system things that I want to talk about. Um, yes. So uh, we've only talked about files up until this point, um, and what we um, and what we have uh, besides files in our file system, uh, do we have things that do we have things other than like Text files or kind of other, uh, other so like what's something that that is that, that you see in a uh, in a file system on a, on a daily basis that's not not a regular file? Okay. The directory. Exactly. Uh, and in uh, when we when we think about uh, directories, uh, and often. Uh, think of them as some kind of uh, tree structure where you have kind of a root directory uh, and then it has um, kind of directories within that uh, and then uh, maybe there's kind of my home directory within home, uh, and then within this, there's the actual file, foo.txt. Uh, and so it's, it's helpful to think about our kind of directory structure uh, in this uh, tree, kind of tree-like arrangement, but in print, like internally, Our directory is basically just going to be a special kind of file that is itself a list of files that's in the directory. 
Um, and so you can, like, this does, in fact, uh, potentially anyway, form a tree or have nodes, uh, nodes that are directories have a bunch of children, which are this list of files, maybe other directories. But uh, the, the data structure are kind of a directory is just another file that itself kind of has a bunch of pointers to, to other files on, on, in the file system. Um, there are uh, two uh, if we um, uh, we can make a make a new directory with with uh, mkdir make directory um, and I can see that now there is this new directory in here and I can change. Uh, into that, and if I run ls, there is kind of nothing that appears to be in there, but if I run ls-a to show me everything, I see that there are actually two entries in this empty directory, and they're both colored purple, indicating that they are also directories. Anyone know what this dot and dot dot are? Well, dot is the current directory, and dot dot is the yeah, so every directory has an entry that refers to itself. Um, so if you've ever seen commands that are like dot slash uh, thing, it says current directory slash file within the current directory. Uh, and dot dot is the, that's how I say just kind of one directory up from, from the current one. Um, uh, and I can uh, remove a directory with rmdir, and that, that gets rid of it. Um, but if I try to remove uh, this directory with um, other files inside it, it's going to tell me that I, it's only going to let me remove an empty directory. So it's not going to let me get rid of this list of files, thus stranding like removing the only reference to maybe some other files on disk, and then I just can never reach them, uh, and that's a sort of sad state of affairs. So only going to be able to remove a directory if it couldn't remove the last remaining reference to uh, an actual file on the disk. Uh, speaking of references, um, there is uh, 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 there are there are, there is a way to create kind of links between uh, between files, um, and so if I say uh, ln, which is uh, uh, the uh, command for for creating a link, I say uh, link the file foo to a file called foo two. Um, I need to be in the FS demo. Uh, now I see that there is in fact a file foo2. I can uh, cat foo2. It has the same contents as, as foo. Uh, and I can use the ls-i uh, command to have it show me the what's called the inode number of these two files. And we're going to inode is part of the internal file system implementation. We'll talk about that on, um, on Friday. But the takeaway here is that these two files actually kind of refer to the same uh, thing on the disk, the same kind of piece of our, our the data structure on the disk that's keeping track of files. Uh, and so we've created what's called a hard link, which is foo2 in every way acts as a kind of its own distinct file. Um, uh, but kind of underneath, they're both just kind of referring to the same piece of data on the disk. Uh, I can use the stat command to see a bunch of information about a file. Um, and importantly, on, it's telling me stuff about the device that it's on. And I see that the number of links to this inode is two. Uh, we're also seeing here the permissions for the file. Uh, and the first three are 
execute, read, and write for the owner of the file, AWB. Uh, so it's not executable. Um, can be read and write by the group. And there is a group that is also called AWB that owns this file. Uh, and then uh, the permissions for everyone is anyone can read this file. Uh, but, but not but not write to it. Also has timestamps for uh, accessing, modifying, and, and changing. If I uh, wanted to um, make a script that's just going to say hello there when I run it. Um, and I say to run this, uh, use uh, the bash shell. Uh, if I try and uh, run this, uh, it's going to say permission denied because if I look at the permissions for hello.sh, it's not executable. Uh, but I can change the permissions of a file through the chmod command and say add the executable permission uh, to hello.sh. And we can see that it's turned green to indicate that it's an executable. And we can see that the execute permission showed up for all parts of the file's permission. And now I can get my nice hello there message. Um, the other kind of link we can create uh, it, with LN is what's called a symbolic or soft link, which instead of creating something that acts as its own distinct file and it's just actually referring to the same thing underneath, um, we can uh, create uh, something that is just actually a pointer, just an alias for the original file. And so it gets a different color, and if I ask for more detail, it will actually show me foo3 is not acting as a kind of separate regular file. It's just a pointer to the original foo. I just looked at the permissions for foo3, and it has L and then all of the permissions. Why does that like, work? Uh, so I think the L is to tell us that it's a, a link rather than its, its own distinct file. I'm not actually sure why it was created with um, all these permissions. Um, I wonder if we can get rid of the right permission for it. So getting rid of the right permission on foo3 actually removed the right permission on foo. Mm -hmm. And so my interpretation is that foo3, the, these permissions for foo3 are just saying like, this is a link. It doesn't have its own real permissions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually foo's permissions that, that are uh, being used here. Um, but foo's two is pushed all the trace because you hard linked foo and foo two. So like what's like the actual differences? Like what's like the difference in like use cases for hard link versus not? Um, so in the case where I remove foo, that is where the difference is. Okay. If I remove foo. Um, I now see foo3 has changed color yeah, because it refers to a file that no longer exists. Whereas foo2, it's its own, completely its own file, so it's still in our file system, still referring to the, the data, uh, the same data on the list, uh, on the disk. And if I stat foo2, I see this same block now just has one link to it rather than two. So that's the main difference. Um, does it stand alone as its own file or is it simply a pointer? Other questions? All right, the last thing that I want to throw at you before we leave, it will be very quick, um, is uh, we usually, um, when, we're, when we're reading data off of disk um, uh, or, or other I.O. devices, typically in large chunks, and we don't want uh, necessarily to burn CPU cycles like copying over 
eight bytes at a time. Um, so instead, we'll use what's called a DMA, a direct memory access, where where our CPU will kind of tell the whatever device it's uh, we're getting I/O from that all right you're going to start a um, process start um, you're going to start a direct memory access and here's this reserved chunk of physical memory that you should use and then And then the device itself will be kind of sending the data directly to this memory. And the CPU doesn't need to be executing instructions to copy this whole chunk over. Um, and so this is very commonly used to do, uh, to, to transfer large pieces of, of data from a disk or from the network or, or something like that. All right. That will do it for today. Next time, file system implementation. Uh, the quiz, do 9 p.m. tonight. Find it on, on Moodle. Uh, the lab, uh, due on Friday. Uh, keep thinking about the final project proposals. Uh, I have office hours tomorrow night, and I'll see you on Friday. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody blew it